Open Door Church, how we doing? Awesome. It is such a privilege to be here this morning on Pentecost Sunday. Those of you here in person, those of you watching, man, we just welcome you. We're so grateful we get to do this. We're going to jump right in. You guys good with that? All right, open up your Bibles to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. What's cool about the book of Acts is it is a testimony. It is a written account of things that happened in our roots of our early church. And it gives you a picture of what can be. Testimony. We heard about different testimonies this morning. It's literally designed to help the hearer of the testimony go, if God can do that in someone, he can also do that in me. And the book of Acts is a testimony of what could be for us as the people of God, as kingdom enforcers. You know you're a kingdom enforcer, right? You've been assigned by God to enforce his victory in the earthly realm. And we have to embrace that. So Acts chapter 1, the day of Pentecost, it's just a beautiful, beautiful picture of his goodness and his grace. And, and we'll, uh, we'll park different places throughout the scriptures. We're going to read a few of them. So Acts chapter 1, let's look at verse 3. Now Jesus had just spent three years disrupting normal. When Jesus came, he came as us, not just for us. He literally came to live as a human being, to show what is possible when someone is filled with the Spirit of God, when someone is surrendered to the Spirit of God, and someone who's willing to risk in the fear of the Lord. And he didn't just die for you, he died as you. He didn't just defeat the enemies for you, he defeated them as you. It's really important to understand this. Because when he looked at his disciples in Matthew 28, before he had ascended, and he said, you guys, listen, all authority's been given to me. Remember that, Matthew 28, 16 through 18? All authority's been given to me now. Basically saying, I'm gonna give it to you, I'm gonna hand it over to you. And he got that authority as a human being. Adam and Eve had given away that authority, the second Adam, or the last Adam, came to take that authority back and then distribute that authority to his disciples and to his church. So when you read Acts chapter 1, he was saying, take this authority, go, I'm going to send you, you're going to go and you're going to go make disciples. You're going to teach them, you're going to train them, you're going to baptize them in my name. And so he's given a little more instruction here. We catch this in Acts chapter 1. Let's look at verse 3. It says, he presented himself alive to them, the disciples, after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about what? The kingdom of God. See, what Jesus did is he didn't just bring a message. He brought a kingdom. What we are assigned to do is not just bring a message, we're assigned to actually bring a tangible kingdom, the kingdom of his realm, and see that realm influence and impact this realm. You teachers that stood, it's so important that you keep standing. Because you've been assigned, just like Jesus was assigned to hostile territory. You've been assigned to hostile territory. You being there makes a radical difference. You dads, you being in your family makes a radical difference. You moms, you being in their family makes a radical difference. You students, you being at those schools makes a radical difference. Especially if you understand what we're going to talk about today. Jesus disrupted normal to create discontentment with normal. Every move of God, if you study them, it starts with something disrupting normal. We've had three years of disruption. And then the Spirit of God, for those that are hungry and thirsty, it stirs up discontentment. But it's a Spirit-led discontentment that leads to humility and repentance with the willingness to rebuild and reinforce his kingdom, it should not lead to just tearing everything down. 
We are in a season of spirit-led, holy discontentment that is opening up the door to the bride to begin to contend for his presence like never before. This is what you see in the book of Acts. You see a bunch of individuals that were not okay with normal anymore. They saw their leader do things that they had only dreamed about. And then he gives them these specific instructions in verse 8. He says, you guys, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go and I want you to wait. We're in a waiting period. What you do in the waiting determines a lot of your destiny. If you grow weary in waiting, you could miss so many opportunities. He says, I want you to go wait. I want you to come together. I want you to be one mind. I want you to have, be one people. And I want you guys all to hunger and thirst for something you've never experienced. I need you to wait. Because if you will wait, I am sending a promise. I am going to fulfill Joel chapter 2. Remember the prophet? I'm going to pour out my spirit on all mankind. Young men, man, they're going to prophesy. They're going to have visions. Young women, visions. Old men are going to dream dreams. Men servants, maid servants, everybody's going to get on in the action. We're going to take this thing back to what it was meant to be, a bunch of kings and priests. He says you got to wait, but you got to be in one accord. You got to come together and you all got to ask for the same thing. And this is the season for us as the people of God to contend for his presence more than anything else. We contend for his presence at our school systems. We contend for his presence in our homes. We contend for his presence at our workplaces. Because where his presence is, there is joy. There is hope. There is power. There is strength. There is glory. Without his presence, there's darkness. You have been given an assignment to enforce the very victory he won through his death, burial, and resurrection. And here's what's amazing. He said, I'm not just going to give you authority, I'm going to give you power. So you won't misuse your authority. And he said, you got to wait. And so they wait, right? They're in one mind. They're going for it. They're crying out. They're believing for him to invade their place with his promise. Yeah? Verse 14 of Acts 1 says, they were there in one accord, devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. So there was oneness, and they're all praying. You may feel like you can't change anything, but I'm telling you, every one of you can pray. You may not understand, when you begin to align with God's word and prophesy and pray his word, Psalm 103 says the angels of God, they will take the word that was spoken and perform it. We got to get back to being a supernatural church. That word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It's able to pierce to the depth of joint and marrow. It can read thoughts and intentions. When you give voice to his word, the word of God is declared. Angels come and go, here I am. But if the enemy keeps you prayerless, he keeps you powerless. We got to get back to just old school intercession. So when God looks, like in Ezekiel's day, he said he looked for a man. He couldn't find anybody to stand in the gap. He couldn't find somebody to build a wall. If he looks upon you guys, open door church, I'm telling you, I believe he finds a people that's willing to stand in the gap and build the wall. Am I talking to the right people? And we got to stay one. We can't let culture, we can't let the spirit of this age divide us. We got to be one. We may disagree on certain things, but I'm telling you, all of us agree the presence of God is better than not having it. Yeah. It's time to contend for his presence. How many contenders we have? Yeah. Chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost had arrived, they were all together in one place, suddenly Suddenly, man, we are going to prophesy that there's going to be some suddenly moments once again in the church's history, in the church's activity. We need some moments when he just shows up suddenly, that it startles you. 
How many of you ever been startled before? We need some suddenly moments. Suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty, mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. If he did it then, he can do it now. You know, wind in the hands of a good God is very good. Winds in the hand of the enemy causes destruction. Winds in the hand of God causes distinction. It reveals, it blows away the stuff that we shouldn't have, the chaff, and it reveals the wheat. Fire in the hands of a good God brings refining. And he's so cool because he burns off stuff in your life you never would have chosen to burn off. You know, it's funny, man, before this service, I felt that little thing when I'd go out to play a game, I felt that little, ner that little, that nervous anxiety that I felt like I was going to go rip somebody's head off. <laughs> That's what I feel in this moment. I feel like we're supposed to be a bunch of lambs that have a lion's head. Yeah. It's a funny picture. Close your eyes and envision a lamb with a big old lion's head. Tongues of fire were distributed. The Spirit comes with fire and wind sometimes. Spirit moves in ways you can't understand and comprehend sometimes. It says they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. You imagine that, they get filled with the Holy Spirit. They start literally speaking in other languages. Not like the prayer language tongues. You know, untie my bow tie, I should have revved up, you know, rev up my Honda, all that. None of that. It was real language. Real languages. The baptism of Holy Spirit is very practical. It's not meant to be mystical. Humans make it mystical. Tongues is a very practical tool because with tongues can come interpretation. And so you hear a group of individuals speaking languages they had never spoken before. All of a sudden, a bunch of people are, are, arrive and they're hearing this commotion and they're hearing in their native tongues. See, what happened throughout human history, I'm gonna give you a little history lesson because they asked, what does this mean? I wanna tell you what this actually means. Go over to Genesis chapter 11. Tower of Babel, everybody knows the story, right? After the flood, God comes to Noah, his family, he says, repeats the command he gave Adam and Eve. He says, go, be fruitful, multiply, take dominion. He wipes out this whole breed, these half-breed Nephilim. He does a work in the earth that man could not do. He brings a flood, he wipes things clean. He starts over with a man and his family. God always starts over with a man and his family. Fast forward, there's a demonic leader that is now organized everybody. They're all speaking the same language. They build out this whole worship complex called the Tower of Babel. It's actually a ziggurat, which is a worship complex. The ancient Near East people understood when you hear these terms, it was a complex built to centralize the presence of the gods. The opposite of what Jesus said the Great Commission is, which is to go. You do realize your assignment is to know, grow, and go, not know, grow, and stay. Doesn't mean you can't come to church on Sundays, but you should be exporting what you've been importing. And so what happens, they build this out. God, the Father who has this divine family, there's a group of individuals he created that are, that are celestial, there are other gods. He comes to them and goes, let us go down and see what humanity's doing with what I've given them. It's like a building inspector coming and he comes down and inspects and he goes, whoa, 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 whoa. There's unity, but it is totally demonic. They're being led astray. Let's do something. Let's bring some wind, let's bring some fire, and let's confuse them all. And he confuses all their languages, right? Now they can't understand, so he disperses them. This is one of the greatest tragedies in the scriptures. 
He basically takes these people that decided to go a different way and says, the way of these other gods, he says, if you want their way, I'm giving you permission. And what he does is he distributes all the nations. He disinherits the nations. Got to understand this because Psalm 2 says, ask of the nations, you can have them. He's talking about Jesus, the Messiah. Jesus came for the Jew first, but he also came for the nations. He distributes these languages. Scholars have determined that of those nations, there were 70. And when you read read, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 32, it talks about how God reassigned the nations to these gods. Are you following? So these other nations that are under the influence of oppressive gods are real. These gods are real. I'm sorry you got brought up in the West where you've been taught you're a monotheist. I'm not a monotheist. I am a guy that believes in multiple gods, but I worship and serve the highest one. His name's Yahweh. There are other gods. If you don't believe me, look at Psalm 82. Look there, real quick. This is super important. You, you got to track with me. Bear with me. You guys bear with me? What does this have to do with Pentecost? Everything. Seventy nations were reassigned. He starts over with a man named Abram. He disinherits the nations. Starts over. Psalm 82 gives us insight. God has taken his place in the divine council. This is Yahweh looking at the other gods, and he brings a judgment. And this is what Yahweh says to these other gods, these lesser gods. How long will you judge unjustly? Show partiality to the wicked. What is happening in our world right now? These aren't just human beings conjuring up. They're being led by real, real forces, real, real gods. If you don't understand this, you will go into a war that you're not even on the battlefield. My job as a preacher is to educate you so you know where your fight actually is. These are not just demons. These are rulers, authorities, and powers that have been assigned over entire people groups to keep them enslaved. This is his judgment. Because you do this, you show partiality. He says you should be given justice to the weak. You guys should have been given justice to the fatherless. You guys should have maintained the right of the afflicted and the destitute. You should have rescued the weak and needy. You should have delivered them from the hand of the wicked. And then here's what he says, you are all gods. Sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, he gives them a judgment. You're going to die like the humans do. If you're a God and you've just been told by the one that created you, your ultimate sentence is, you are going to become like a being that was formed out of dirt. Do you see now why the serpent had a problem with human beings in the garden? Because that is a divine being going, they better not have the same authority I have. And you do realize that in the age to come, you will rule and reign with Jesus. You actually take these guys' place. You want to know why they hate you? It's because they know their end and most of the church doesn't know their end. Most of the church doesn't understand this. The day of Pentecost is more than just about power. It's about God, Yahweh, through Jesus Christ, coming on a day. Jesus said, I'll baptize you with Holy Spirit and fire. Jesus baptizes the church. On that day, historians, scholars have figured it out, of those nations that were there, guess how many were there? Seventy. These individuals that go, what does this mean? Catch this, this is super important. This is the beginning of reclaiming the nations. I can see by some of your looks, you're like, gods, there's other gods. Some of you are still stuck there. (laughs) Because you've never been taught a cosmic supernatural worldview sometimes. It's very normal in church. I never taught this stuff. 
But when you understand it, you go, wait a minute. When somebody gets baptized, because that's what's going to happen, when those cats, those 3,000 people got baptized, you know what they were doing. They were declaring loyalty to the supreme being named Yahweh. And coming out of alignment with all these lesser gods. Because those folks came for the feast. They had been distributed. These individuals that are hearing in this language, guess what? They were sent, literally positioned through their ancestors in nations that were ruled by hostile gods. And they come and they start hearing in their own tongue the kingdom of God. They start hearing about Jesus. They start hearing about the Messiah. Guess what? Guess who's the first wave of the Great Commission? These 3,000 individuals, what shall we do? What does this mean? This means that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. This means you and I are going to be part of one of the greatest moves of God in human history where the power of God is going to be distributed upon us and we're going to be those that are embedded in hostile territory. I don't care what you say. America is hostile territory for you as a kingdom person. You're living in a dream world if you think this is a Christian nation. And I have offended 78% of you. Yes, there's Christian roots. Yes, there were Christian principles that founded. Yes, 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 all that. But I'm telling you, you know in your heart of hearts, you are in hostile territory. And you feel like you're outnumbered. And I'm just asking God to open your eyes to see who's with us. Because who is with us is so much more than who's with them. You cannot believe the hype of the media. But you are not the majority as it relates to the, the, the culture. You are not the majority. You are considered an irrelevant minority. My question is, what are you going to do about it? Cry? Stay home? Don't go to work? Don't go to school? Don't, don't, don't. Are, are we going to become those people that embrace the identity that he has given us power and authority to bring a kingdom into every place we go. This kingdom works better out there many times than in here because there's way too much unbelief in here. Uh Uh-oh, Brian's stepping on some toes. He's getting a little, Brian's picking a fight, absolutely. That's why Jesus, when he brought healing to certain places, he kicked everybody out except a few. Most healing doesn't take place inside the church because we've been trained in unbelief sometimes. Not this church. You want to know why I love Open Door? Because you guys literally do things that torments these rulers. You give justice to the poor. You rescue the enslaved. You feed the poor. Do you understand me? The stuff you guys do And even if you're not doing it, but you give to it, the stuff that you guys do is is the actual stuff that intimidates rulers and authorities. He is not intimidated by a church service. He's not wowed by my preaching. He's not very happy that I talked about the gods. Because some of you are going to go, I need to look into this. I've been misinformed. Some of you guys got to get informed about the real battle. Elections are important because whoever leads our nation and agrees with the inferior, lesser God's methodologies, he agrees for our nation. And you get subjected to it. School boards matter. City councils matter. Government matters. You know what these guys' assignment was? They get baptized, they get saved, these 3,000 people. They're now embedded, secret, supernatural agents 
who now go back to their hostile environments and now know the gospel of the kingdom in their actual language. That is amazing. What if this morning God birthed a new language in you? A new understanding. Can you stand to your feet? What, what if he released something in your spirit today? What if you walked in today, you didn't know anything about Jesus, and you're hearing this and you're going, man, I need this Jesus. What if you've been walking with him for a long time, but you feel this thing in you that goes, man, I am just not okay with how things are. I need fire. I need power. I need a fresh baptism. The outpouring of the Spirit is for practical purposes. Words of wisdom, words of knowledge, prophetic utterances, those are the daily bread. That's what the church has to be. Pentecost was the birthing of a supernatural church, not a natural church. And when you guys link up and become one mind and begin to pray and contend for God's presence, and you also do the works that undo the works of these other gods, you can imagine how God wants to send resources, how he wants to send people. You can imagine a God who is our God looks at a hungry and thirsty people. You can imagine how he wants to pour out. So can we all lift our hands? I'm just asking you, please, just bear with me. Just lift your hands real high to heaven. Now, it doesn't matter where you're at in your walk with Jesus. It doesn't matter if you know him fully today or not. He hears the cry of the afflicted. He hears the hearts of his people. Burnt offering and sacrifice he doesn't need, but a broken and contrite heart, man, he just loves that kind of heart. Would you give him your heart today? Would you say, Lord, you have my heart. Father, you have my heart. Jesus, you have my heart. Spirit of God, would you begin to change my perspective of everything? Help me embrace my identity. Just talk to him, say, would you give me the ability to embrace the identity that I am a supernatural ambassador? I've been embedded in my world and in this culture. You've assigned me for this problem. I take responsibility for it. Lord, would you come into my home? Would you come into my family? Would you begin to breathe fire? Would you begin to breathe, let your wind blow? Would you begin to deal with the stuff that keeps me bound and stuck? Would you fill me with your presence once again? Come on, just begin to cry out. There's times, Acts 2, Acts 4, when people came together with one mind and one heart. He fills the whole room. Surrender. Some of you know what it's like to be intoxicated by other substances. Listen to me. Let the Holy Spirit take over every part of you today. Be intoxicated with the Holy Spirit today. Open up your mouths and drink. All you got to do is ask. He'll pour out that good wine. Lord, we come as the people of God surrendered, empowered, we pick up the cross, we pick up our mindset, we pick up our hearts, we pick up our minds, we bring them into your presence right now, and we ask that you let the fire come and let the wind blow. Just begin to say that, Lord, let your fire come, let your wind begin to blow all throughout this service. God, we release healing to bodies right now. We release healing to minds right now. We release healing to relationships right now. Father, would you loose healing, refreshment, and a fresh outpouring. Those of you that maybe have not met Jesus, just begin to cry out, say, Jesus, I want to know you. I want to surrender to you. I want to give my life to you. Those of you that are discontent, say, Father, would you fill up this discontentment with power, with anointing. Those 3,000 people, here's what they did. You know what they did? They took what they were given, they went back home, and they distributed it. They became the foundation when Paul and others would come they became the foundation, those that had sowed the seed for the harvest of the nations. You're here today because of that seed. You are part of the nations. You represent the nations. Jew, Gentile, 
that's his bride. Can I get an amen?